So today we're still um, trying to read parts of uh, the text. See, it's, it seems to be a man manageable text, but we I'm going to do something very unsavory and ask that we skip down without leaving behind or dismissing. Obviously, as I've told you, I'm a servant of a, of a work, and I, I would want to spend six weeks on, on the first sentence, or half of the first sentence. Um, so this goes against my nature. But can we, would you agree to this, to the brutalization that requires us to move to the um, next to last, the penultimate paragraph that says einmal once. So einmal als ich ins Wirtshaus kam. So once when I arrived at the tavern. Do you have that? Mm -hmm. So uh, in German, einmal is a little more, um, perhaps, um, indicative of a kind of break, uh, or even the possibility that you now will get, in English, of a unique event, once. <coughs> once something happened, one day or one time, when I arrived at the tavern, a guest was sitting at my observation post. So note, um, we were, we were um, this guy doesn't have a job, but he does have a kind of post, which is an observation post. And we were discussing about leaving, what it is to leave one's post. And he displaces, there's a place where he usually hangs out or hangs back and observes and does or doesn't drink beer. So now something, and this is the Kafkian micrological shock event. See, it's not going to be there was an earthquake or a bunch of bandits came and, and, and did this or that. It's almost on the level of in occurrence. Something is going to swell up into an event, but that doesn't present itself with all the fanfare of event. It's almost in retreat, but it's already, since it's Kafka's signature, you have to have the background music of da 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 da, or more complicated than my infantile musical scroll right now. You know, once when I arrived. So here, I thought I arrived. This is a question of arrival. We're also also always thinking of the letter that we're going back to, or that we're going to try to have arrived, have had arrived toward us, at us. Once when I arrived, so here I think I'm on arrival, a guest, I'm gust. Um, see, this is interesting because the translator must have dozed off and left her post or his post because the translator left out, unless I'm mistaken, schon ein Gast. Already there was a guest. So that's a big, uh, we don't have time to get into the unconscious of the translator. <coughs> Why did the translator dump that? That's pretty important. Someone was already <coughs> sitting in my place. Okay, this is Kafka, we have the background music, the drums looming and so on and so forth. Um, so I arrived at the, the tavern. This is my, I'm virtually homeless, not <coughs> quite, I have a bed somewhere. So my other place, my home room, will be the tavern, the pub, the bar that I go to every day. In my désœuvrement, we don't have time to go over beer, alcohol, <coughs> drugs, and whether this is working or not when you drink. Um, for Baudelaire and Poe, drinking 
is a, a part of a resurrectionist memory. And here I point us very quickly only to those movies or scenes. They're a staple part of the filmic diet where a guy's sitting at a bar looking at his, you know, glass and memory and phantoms are coming up. This is what happened. It's a part of a narrative uh, startup machine. So for Baudelaire and Poe, drinking, drugging is part of um, a way of working the phantoms. It's a resurrectionist memory. Stuff, stuff comes up that alcohol releases. Um, so I would say if we had five years, which I wish we had to discuss this text, it's not a matter of indifference that he does or doesn't, he spits out, he pours out, he's disgusted. There's, we've been talking about taste and disgust, distaste. He's disgusted by the very beer he orders. Once in a while he drinks it during the day. And what that means in terms of working mind, in terms of what comes up, what opens up in the, um, you know, the loner's relation to a drink when one is in désœuvrement, which is inevitable at the bar, but there is a kind of work that's taking place when you're alcoholizing. So once he arrives here, there was already a guest sitting at my observation post. So the word is guest. We're in the realm of hospitality. Guest is close to, in both all languages here that I see, ghost, um, and gust, a host, maybe in French. Well, what is this guest? Is it a sacred guest? Is it an intruder? Well, this guy who's already down to the, that really slid down the scale of being, this is the only thing he had was his seat, his regular seat at the Stammtisch of his um, destitution, or what's it called again when you have your regular bar seat? You know what I'm talking about? That um, this is where you hang out, and it's your seat, so to speak. Hmm? As a regular, you show up as a regular. But that, this was his observation post. So he shows up. Am I going too slowly, or no, is this cool? Norm. Okay. What? That's norm in cheers. OK, that helps. The norm. Yeah. <laughs> norm. Right, the norm. The normative, the regular. So, so he's been replaced. He, now, this is part of, hey, I don't have a job. He's down to having a place a covert place from which he observes everyone else at the tavern and into which he's backed up. Don't forget, again, from the letter, what it meant for um, little Franz to be deported from his room to the Pavlach. So this guy finds a kind of niche, without Nietzsche, uh, a niche where he can, from which he, it's his observation post. But he's been replaced. Not only doesn't he have a job anymore, now he has, he's been replaced by a guest. I did not dare look at him closely. So that, if we had three years, this not daring to look, this is an observation post, but I couldn't look at him closely. That this is the servant being, too. I don't know if you know that people from certain cultures don't look at you when they talk to you because it's considered disrespectful. But for other cultures, it's codified differently. Like, why won't they look at them? You know? But to look at someone is already to judge, to think you could, to maybe harm them, to have a penetrating glance, to shoot them a look, to, to size them up, to, to um, lord it over them maybe to think you're equals. So this is the certain, he, he didn't dare look at ich uh, nicht, genau hinzusehen. So I didn't dare look at him exactly or closely and was about to turn round in the door. So I wanted, 
ich wollte mich gleich in der Tür wieder umdrehen und weggehen. So, I immediately wanted to turn in the door. So here's the door. He's trying to come in. Is he welcome? Is he not? Um, is he out, an outsider, an outcast? This is his space. He's territorialized it in the most um, precarious way. And then there's someone there. So he just he didn't dare look, and he feels himself once again dismissed, ejected, <coughs> pushed away. He turns around. He's going to turn his back to this other guest, and he's going to leave. So here he's, he thinks he can take leave. This is also a repetition of the whole thing. Can you leave your job? Can you leave your post? He wants to leave. The guest, however, aber der Gast rief mich zu sich. So the guest, however, called me over. So here's another modality of the call. You know, he saw me approach. I was kind of startled that someone had my seat and my post. I'm going to turn my back and run away, kind of. But here comes a call. The guest called me over. And it turned out that he, too, was a servant. So we're kind of equals. Here's another it's servant to servant here, whom I had once seen somewhere before, but without having spoken to him. So this comes, I mean, if we had time, this is Kafka, and he really sets the codes all over the place in his writing. There's, in every text, there's a reader's manual that you can try to find. But if Kafka says, um, and I would try to show you where he tells you how to read in his, some of his novels. When Kafka says, I had once seen this person before, that also needs background music. This is the return of something. Maybe it is a ghost, a guest ghost. What is the status of another guest? But it's a return of something. He recognizes someone or something something that wants to talk to him, that, want, that calls him over. So it's not an initiating newness or a new person. It's someone from the past, perhaps, vaguely or, or insistently. What is it that has returned to take his place? He's displaced and replaced and called by the very um, figure or force that has replaced him. And the voice says, why do you want to run away? Why do you want to walk away or run away? Sit down and have a drink. Ishtsas, I will pay. So here's, here's um, already an economy an economy of the impoverished, the, um, is it a gift or is it an indebtedness? Is this Jesus Christ who's going to pay for all his debts? What, is, what does it mean when someone says, it's on me? I know that sounds like, okay, so what, what's going on here? Is it a gift or is it part of an economy? It Does it break the economy? And here, if we had time, I would want us to recognize the difference between a gift and an economy. For, for Derrida, the gift breaks any kind of economy. If a gift is a gift, you, you may not even know that you received it. You don't know when it arrives. If, however, someone says to you, hey, I gave you a birthday present, now you owe me one, that's not a gift. That's still part of an economy. Anything that obligates you is not an economy. So the gift, to be what it is, is always already on the road to potlatch. Do you know what potlatch is? When you just did, yes? I was just going to say, additionally, he's offering to get him something that he doesn't like. Very important, too. It's, it's almost a, a forced offer. I mean, this, this happens, right, when someone, I remember when, uh, I don't know if this is pertinent, but I'm just trying to lubricate some of the um, machinery here. I had quit smoking. Nancy was going to have a heart transplant. I went to visit him. 
in Strasbourg. No, it was in summer place. And um, he said, let's go have a smoke, a last smoke. And I thought, I can't refuse that. That's a gift. That's an offer. He's going to smoke his last cigarette before a major surgery that may or may not, you know, go well. And I couldn't say, well, you know, I just struggled to stop, you know. <laughs> so there's the, it's what, hmm? Voila, gift, gift, you know. Gift means poison in German as well. It's the gift, gift. So this is a gift, gift as well, which has a double structure. However, I just wanted to point out that it, all sorts of things are happening. The, the um, other is calling and asking you to, to um, come down to a, in size. There's always the sizing in Kafka, right? We, we discussed it in, in Judith's class. I don't know if we discussed it enough here where someone is crouching, someone is um, oversized. This is part of the way that Kafka uh, measures relatedness. Who's lording it over you? Who's towering? Who's crouching and, and humbled? Who then moves? Because he's also very interested in who's brought down slow-mo and what that means for the guy to say, sit down have a drink, I'll pay. So is this a gift? Is this initiating an economy? I'll pay. Is it, again, the Christology of, of I will pay for all your debts? Or uh, what is going on here? Is this an exam? It's called the Prüfung, it's the test. So I sat down. He asked me several things. So I sat down. So this does become an examination. You know, when the other is this, and this is part of what um, Anne was trying to say about Derrida on, on, on hospitality, which is, and I think she whizzed by as I said, I, I don't know if you caught this, but what it means to offer unconditional hospitality, which isn't something one can even, what Derrida is doing as he does with forgiveness is he goes into a place that we think we know something about, he shows its violent edges and its impossibility. So um, he's pointed out that one is only hospitable in Kant, the great cosmopolitan. First of all, if one has a house and is a homeowner, as, as we said the other night, so that you can show hospitality. What are the conditions of possibility for showing or giving hospitality? But the other thing that Derrida points out is that people ask for some um, ID. Do you ever throw open your house to a person who doesn't give you some sort of indication of name, where they come from? Aren't you always kind of policing the other? Do you allow anyone, the, even the sacred other or the monstrous intruder, to just come in, and isn't there a timer on? Like if someone, if you showed hospitality to someone that were unconditional, you wouldn't say, well, I have to get up early in the morning, or um, thanks for coming over. You would open your house and yourself and your being to the other without even knowing who the hell this is or what they want, even if they, if you, that you never know what the demand is. You wouldn't ask, you wouldn't have implicitly had them go through security clearance to even arrive at the threshold and the door of a possible hospitality. So extending hospitality is already so restrictive and conditional normally. You think you're so generous and hospitable, but you know a lot about the other that you let in. So Derrida wonders, what would it be like to actually practice unconditional hospitality where you don't mind and repeat police action and say so who are you this is how long you're up here's the here's the visa you can stay in my home for three hours and ten minutes max then you're out so already that's not really hospitality even if you made a fabulous meal or something like that best wine and so on 
that's not hospitality because those codes are very, very restrictive and cruel in a way. You know too much, meaning you've already um, ID'd the person. Yeah, that's why we so often need a passport, something to get us through the door. Uh, a visa is, is a pollution with that. Uh, a visa, a, an appearance, a deed, a uh, deed which I'll open on to avoid because it too has its violent edges. A passport at any point that you present it, even if it has a photographic evidentiary trace, all it takes is the, the decision of somebody who has uh, an upset stomach, they don't like your face, and make the decision that there's a non-correspondence between a photographic image of you, a hypothetical corollary in an archive somewhere, and you standing before them. All the power of the state as a dismissal or rejection or acceptance comes into play. Exactly. So um, this is some of the stuff that was brought up the other night on Fast Forward, in, in part. So I sat down. So if we had time, since this is Kafka territory, what is it to, to say sit down to the other, okay? Is it an order, an injunction? What is an invitation? Some invitations are very intrusive, like when they know you're trying to write and you need your, um, no, you know, you need to secure your no-fly zone, leave me alone, but then there's an invitation. <coughs> that, that may not be necessary. It could be a gift gift, it could be an intrusion, it could be a delight, a release, a salvation, a greeting. But is he invited to sit down? Is he commanded? If this were rat man, rat man, it would be, holy shit, now I have to sit down. I, I don't have the resistance to not sit down. And I am a servant means if I will get an utterance um, directed my way, it will have to be a command, okay? Sit down and have a drink. And so that's why it's very important that you point out this is not what he wants, and it's already been queued up as such, that drinking, as you're drinking your scotch, uh, <laughs> drinking is, um, is, is disgusting, he says to him. So what is even the nature of the ghost guest's uh, replacement part being saying to him, sit down and have a drink, I'll pay. Meaning you'll be on my payroll. Who, what does it mean to even, even though it's on me, sounds like the, the greatest offer, it does put you somehow in the economy of the other, possibly at the mercy of the other. Okay, this may not be how you experience it when someone offers you a drink. Um, so I sat down. So I sat down. So what kind of a causality is it? Because the other pays or because I was ordered to, to sit down or because I was commanded or because I wanted to hang out with this person? But the person does turn out to be a kind of interrogatory checkpoint, right? He asked me several things, but I couldn't answer. Indeed, I didn't even understand his question. So this is a, a, a way also to rescan the Derrida on, on hospitality, which is, um, again, very quickly on, on, on said, what does it mean when you extend hospitality or the immigrant arrives, they don't usually necessarily know your language or understand what you're saying. So here's a problem too, at the threshold of an encounter where the other doesn't understand. Not only couldn't he answer, he does not understand. So something is happening on the order of an event. This is whizzing by him. This is traumatically unintelligible to him, this encounter. He doesn't understand, he can't answer, and he's kind of being paid for by this provisional other. Is this other a representative of the law, of the bosses, of the calling system that he's failing to get himself um, assimilated to? 
who's, who's this mysterious guest that comes from somewhere in the past? Uh, representing or fronting for. Um, so I couldn't even understand his questions, so I said, perhaps you are sorry now that you invited me, so I'd better go. So he's ready to go. He can't comply with the um, questionnaire or the formulas that um, he's supposed to sign up for and with in order to stay as as the one who was invited. And I was about to get up. Und ich wollte schon aufstehen. But he, stra he stretched his hand out over the table and pressed me down. Drückte mich nieder. So this is ambiguous and ambivalent when the other stretches a hand, and in the letter, the hand, the play of the hand is very important. It can smack you down, it can wave you. You can go through the door or the security, you can wave goodbye. The father says to Franz Kafka, I'm giving you a free hand, do what you want. But he always threatens to uh, beat him. In any case, in this case, and in German, it's, it's strong. You have to see that suddenly this hand, you know, it's, it's maybe a reach out and touch moment. Maybe it's coercive. It's unreadable, strictly unreadable. If this is a moment, as many invitations are, as I say, of coercive, abusive demand put on you, right? He's, or is this an embrace? Am I? a lifesaver bringing you over or back to a place of, of welcome and comfort. Even in Kafka land, if it is a welcoming moment, it, it can't be pure welcome. There's going to be the scary horror show moment of what is his hand doing there? And he's pressing me down. This is, it could be sexual. It could be violent. It certainly is. Er drückte mich nieder. So he pushed me down. He pressed me is a, an elegant way of saying, right? Um, I was almost oppressively um, um, humbled or something. So he stretched his hand out over the table, and we were talking about tables and, and what tables institute and keep apart or, or allow for, and he pressed me down. Stay, he said. So here's the moment of also invitation to stay. That was only a test. He who does not answer the questions has passed the test. So I don't know how you want to read this. It is a parable. What is a parable? What, what does it try to... Um, um, stage here as a predicament, as as um, as a situation. Yesterday we tried to um, find the temporality of testing. You will have been tested, and here he's invited to stay. It may be, if you want a quasi happy ending, that this is his post. He can stay, but he was firstly. Um, alienated and dispossessed of his post. Someone is ta has taken his place. And he now has to go through all of this ritual of being invited to stay to take his place. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so he's invited to stay. That was only a test. And what is a test? Again, here, this, this is what this whole um, segment asks what a test is. What does that refer to? Um, das war ja, das, so does it refer to the entire désoeuvrement? Does it refer back to and cover the fact that he, he hasn't been called to work? Is all of this a test? That he's been displaced several times? That there is no place for him? And here would be the paradox and parabolic 
logic of the Kafkan text that you are invited to stay there where you have no place, where you're radically dislocated from your locus. That's where you can stay, in a place that you can't dwell in. But that's where you can stay because you have endured the impossibility of responding to a call. So there's all sorts of twists and permutations that I've only begun to instigate or consider. And what is this other doing there? Inviting him to, to reclaim his place, which he now radically can't call his place and has to have been called to from the other and by the other. When it was his post, his secret place, <coughs> Um, he, he lost it. Is this a greater losing of it when you have to rely on another servant? This is what's important too, that the other, nonetheless there's the insinuation always in Kafka of hierarchy. Even where you're equals, the other can beat the crap out of you or humiliate you or um, harm you. It's not just a matter of class difference, which he never, never denies, but there's something pernicious and unreadable in the approach of the other, and the approach is even as a handshake or an arm disarmed coming across the table to smack you or welcome you or place you in your place. He is being put in his place, which is not a nice thing either. Um, so we, we need to think of all of these possible Kafkaian um, programs that are running through this little text. Elaine and then Thomas. I think that there's a, a discourse here of someone who's wallowing in his objectness and the question of whether he in fact is play acting <coughs> at having power um, and being, you know, in claiming his servitude, there are many gestures along the way that indicate that he is not in fact being servile. Even in the act of being pressed down, we read that he is about to get up, but the act of being pressed down means that he has gotten up. Right. Now, when so you say wallowing, I have to say that I'm wondering, is this coming from an institutional superego? Because is there any indication in the text that there's wallowing or acting up or out or, or any kind of resistance? I think that he's thoroughly enjoying his position. Where, where, where is um, Marshall evidence for me? Uh, where was it that I? Because I, I wouldn't oppose that at all. Because in Kafka, there's often the secret jouissance of it's the seeing of the other servant and electing not to speak. That was the point. For me. See, I think there's too much volition there. He's not electing. I think that's why I was trying to start up with. Uh, radical passivity mm -hmm. on the level of Levinas. I'd be very happy to be shown the potholes and, and pockmarks of this landscape I'm, I'm thinking I'm attending to. But my sense is, and you're right, very right in terms of other of Kafka's texts, that there's secret stores of delight and bliss and even erotic. Uh, he gets off on on some of the objection in other texts. Yeah. Here I'm not seeing it. There was somebody already in my place. Ah, that's a tonality issue. Right? This is an email that you may, you may not have meant to send this way. <laughs> if, let, but, let, if we went around the room me. and said, one day, I mean, I know. ask it, text. say it, boom it out as a tra traumatic subject, barely a subject, who, who is just pure subjection, once, when I arrived at the tavern, a guest was sitting at my observation. But even in that, even in that, there is a sense of how dare someone sit in that place. That's that so interesting place. that you see that. That was my place. Now no, we're in the Kafkaian no Midrashic space where I'm seeing it very differently. And I do agree, it's good of you to point out that it says my place place, because there's certainly irony there. There's oh, no really, lie. you have a place? To a truly subjective persona, 
There is no mind. Okay. Um, you dispossess your ownership of yourself. Yes, this will be translated as once because it's a repetition in once. Right. It's it's something a disruption. It is something that happened in the past and now. I'm right. That's else. why I said I'm mine. One time. Um, Thomas and then Paris. Uh, uh, your thought really comes to the end point. It is absolutely a matter of possession, not only to, to have, to hold, to grasp, to take, um, but also possession to, to have been bound, otherwise to have been uh, possessed and coerced, and so on and so on. So absolutely it is a matter of possession, because we will recall uh, he takes his place at the invitation of another. And I will insist on the duplicity, the figure of doubling again at that notion of taking one's place, takes his place, to take his place is to possess and to be possessed, to take a place that was his and now is not, to take the place that is consigned to him or conceded by the other. And that brings us back to the next point, and to talk about the sentence that, that actually you opened up, and I, I think that, that that notion of to tamper, to irritate, that it out is the word force a name, to madden, to, to irritate, to poke uh, a place and, and set it to resonance. And the sentence there is, and I'll, I'll take the English portion of it, the only thing he had was his regular seat. And the word uh, on which we can turn set two resonances in play is regular. Regular, it, it is uh, regular, uh, that is to say repetitive, regulating, it is a habit. It's also regulus, a rule, a rule which grounds uh, a kind of habit. And in that sense, it is a a figure, uh, kind of catechetically duplicitous, but a figure of the law. Uh, it also has to do with the notion of a commonplace. Commonplace, a communal place, a community uh, towards which his position is one of abeyance or, or, or proximity or with an immunity. And so it's a, it's a kind of uh, irritating transformation between immunity and community that, that occurs. Not even, and, and doesn't it's restless, it doesn't resign one or the other, it, it, it fibrillates between them so that there's a displacement of the subject of the law from a place which is already taken up residence at a certain distance from the law and comes back at an invitation to a closer proximity to the law and there are consequences to that. So that would be one way to set those things into a kind of resonance and, and read it and that's where I will end. Okay, okay. Um, I, uh, I read this um, in, uh, okay, if we're talking about this as a, as a, as a parable, um, and you make the connection to the, to the parabola, uh, I think it was Galileo who discovered that uh, projectiles follow uh, the trajectory of a parabola when they're being mm -hmm. uh, cast. And um, this reminds me of um, Gabor von Heidegger. Um, and I wonder how much of Heidegger, Heideggerian Thronus is in this story um, of this. Uh, is this your, your simplistic uh, intervention? <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know, but you know, uh, this um, honest, um, you know, dealing with the immediacy of the situation uh, as as a, as a, as a cast projectile. And then there's one other thing which I can't, I really can't develop here because um, I don't have the text in front of me, but. I know that um, Kafka was an admirer of the others, uh, the, the Swiss German writer Robert Walser, um, who, um, whose whole persona, literary persona, reminds me of the writer in this story, in his, um, what's come to be termed minorism, um, this uh, sort of uh, almost feel like, uh, when, when he says, perhaps you're sorry that you invited me, Robert Walser throughout his literature um, uh, takes seriously this, this idea of being small and staying small and not being in a position upon the world such that at the end of his life his writing became, not only did his short, stories become shorter and shorter his writing became smaller and smaller until it was a better moment under high until he eventually um, drifted into the snow and died. Isn't that Salser's house right here? No, it's I think Tsukamaya. Right. Or, or who? No, but He's, he's, in, he's part of the community here. This is very helpful, uh, by the way, a student of mine, if we can say that, um, wrote in um, 
a dissertation on Walser called Fine and Klein, meaning fine and tiny, you know, um, and you hear the rhyme. So absolutely thank you, all of you, for, for introducing the difficulty of, of this itinerary. I can go more, um, my stride is less broken by what um, Paris brings to the table for the following reasons, and, and uh, which isn't meant to refute, I'm in no position to refute, I have to think about what you're saying and the duplicity that, that Kafka uh, indicates elsewhere, certainly in his earth. But, but right now, um, the, the, um, I was reading in, in terms of the minoritized trace of the one who barely has the only rights he can claim to a place or a space or a position. And here you have the double meaning of a position. What, you know, a position as a job, a stelle, is um, um, the way you're posited, position, the positionality, the subject, if there's a subject here. See, Kafka, I think, downsized the subject very, very um, severely. And, there, there's never going to be a full-blown subject in Kafka. There are abbreviated uh, letters running around loosely and loose in his text. As we said the other day, there are creatures, there's, there's unrecognizable and disfigured um, uh, effects of language that you can't translate referentially or into anything empirical that you might have seen before. So I was more on the um, track that, um, to which I feel Paris just gave a green light, which is to say, first of all, what can this being without a position, without, and for whom positionality would be laughable, or what does it mean to laugh? Um, in Baudelaire, the ability to laugh strikes a pose of subjective mastery. Um, duplicity means that you have some control over what's going on so that you can split off and also maneuver and negotiate <coughs> and undermine and be um, sneaky. All of those words that go with duplicity, slick, uh, which always suggests great maneuverability. So that's why I was thinking burdened and backed up by a certain historicity and his history of what... Kafka, I do think, sorry for just backing off here, he strips the subject so radically that even the ability to, to show duplicity, which suggests so much, even in a, in a very small place, power, power steering, maybe. Here you have something or someone <coughs> whose pure subjection and submissiveness, we can talk about that as well, uh, whose pure um, submission he doesn't have a mission, but it's a submission, which may be the mission, to submit. To submit to what? To what kind of call? So finally there's the call that comes through. You're right, abjected, degraded. This isn't the call he's been signing up for and waiting for. Or is it? Because it could be that this other guest, and, and looking like a servant, and looking a little... Um, sloppy maybe, is the dress code of the sacred. You never know, and this is what Anne was saying and reminding us, that anyone who shows up at the threshold or in your place and looks um, a little servile or beaten up or in your semi-position might be um, the call, that might be the calling card and dress code of the divine. So we don't know who this guest ghost is who's sitting at your place. It could be like in films that someone's sitting in your, you're the boss and someone's sitting in your place with their feet propped up. It's very menacing. That was the only position that this guy has gotten so far, is a position hidden and created 
as an observation post. Um, I can't help but put this um, along with for the law and also the parable on parables. And I was thinking, in a way, this character becomes like the stupid doorman. Um, Which the, character? The, the, the servant in our story here is sort of... Um, He's not the man from the country? He is the man from the country. He's the doorman from the country. Or I wonder if we could see him as the doorman from the country. Well, I think we have to choose. Um, one or the other? I'm thinking provisionally. But go ahead. Well, it's just in this in the subjection that he is performing. He is, uh, there's an, uh, the authority, maybe his position or the relation of before okay. the authority, before the call. Um, and Very good. That gets me on track as well. Go ahead. So the other, no matter what the other is or who the other is, is accorded an immediate authority as well. He doesn't say out of, that's my seat or get out. He doesn't displace, he is displaced and, and arrives in pure subjection to the position of the other. And this was his only position. I think once again, he's outside his father's house. I think this is a parable. That's in my father's house, there are many rooms. He's looking into this corridor. His father has placed him outside once again. So I think there is a call to the divinity. There's an outside that's also inside. So yeah. that we're, you're, you're absolutely right that this is also um, outside the, the grand house, but it's also inside or Just gives like you an lawsuits. inside view, right? So it, outside and inside are scrambled as distinct spaces, but you're absolutely right to say that there's a movement of deportation or, or outside, toward the outside, yes? That's always possible too, Absolutely. that it's a split. His own it, this is always possible. Um, we could also ask, because remember I called upon us to reflect on the way we're reading, to read us reading why I'm hanging on to my little thread of conviction here, that um, this is um, a kind of scene of violence where you can't tell the difference between a sacred visitation, because it's from the past, could be a ghost, a phantom, an effect of the phantom that has taken your place. This could be the dead father, this could be, we don't know what this ghost guest is, but it's also the one that will give him place. But finally, getting a position is also, um, requires him to go through, so it might be that this text is divided at least in two, let's say provisionally. One is, I'm waiting for the call, I'm waiting to get a job, it's not happening. Then this happens, one day something happens, change of scene, reset, and I am getting, I, again, I don't have a position, but I'm given a position, and look at all of the implicit violence, and um, so on and so forth. Um, yes, please go ahead. Um, okay, very jumbled, so I'm just going to try and talk. Here. That's cool. I'm <laughs> loving the jumble. Um, okay, so first I wanted to talk about the test as kind of like a more radical or oppressive invitation, because now by virtue of his having passed the test and so proved <laughs> his worthiness of staying, he's almost more obliged to stay. So it's, no, you can't leave now. You've passed the test. You're, you're deserving of being here. And so I, I wanted to also tie this in with what Derrida talks about, about the, um, the guest or the foreigner actually being the one who invites the one who invites, because- That's important, what Zoya is saying. Because um, ultimately, it's the guest who, from outside, is offering the key for the master or the host's um, emancipation. But what's interesting here is that the guest, or the supposed guest, because he's, it's actually the guest who's inviting, so it is the guest who invites the one who invites, that is, the person whose post it um, is purported to be, but the guest is inviting from inside. Um, so I'm wondering how that changes the dynamic. You, you've really um, said a lot 
And certainly, again, if we um, just um, return momentarily to what Zoya was pointing out in, in Derrida's text, what does a guest do for the purported ostensible host? Because it's when the guest arrives that you constitute your domestic space. It's the guest that offers the position of, of um, ownership and all sorts of claims. So it's not very clear who is the constitutor here. So by this guest um, inviting and naming and commanding and passing the um, servant guest, they're both guests, um, something gets constituted, however um, disturbed and, and um, unclear. I, I think this takes us also back to uh, Paris's introduction of Gewaffenheit, which is what, where I'm a little more comfortable, and it's something that we, we want to have at least a preliminary grasp on. This is proneness. So for Heidegger, and this is very abbreviated and scandalously um, shorthand, for Heidegger, it's not a matter of a subject or even a subject position or any pump of subjectivity or hope for intersubjectivity, but there's something that throws, like a throw of a dice or just a movement, if it's a movement, of being thrown into existence or into situations. And it's the thrownness itself rather than anything that could claim sovereignty or importance that occurs. So in a sense, one day someone was sitting there, I'm, I'm in a position of, if I'm in a position at all, of being thrown into a situation. And this thrownness with its unreadability and yet with its um, inescapable pressure, because there's pressure being put on his body as well, um, commands us, demands that we read and try to understand the interruption. So here we're reading an interruption. Something happened one day, and then there's the performative speech act that says, I was thrown into something. So this is not that I initiate. This means the minimalization of agency. I didn't create this situation. I didn't benefit for it, from it even though an economy is uh, introduced here, I'll pay for you. Now that could be very, as I suggested, scary, because there's then um, the beholdenness to the one who pays. That becomes possibly the so-called master position, the one who pays you to do something unpleasant in this case, since the guy doesn't like beer. Um, and to incorporate, again, to swallow something you don't like. Um, so I didn't, there's no agency here. This is not volition. This isn't what I want. So it just happens that I was thrown into or this through a sketch in my life. And I didn't understand it. It was unintelligible. There's not even an I, because insofar as I am an I, I'm sheer subjection. I'm sheer service, I'm in service of the other, and um, I was told performatively that I had passed a test. So this might be also a rewrite of so many biblical narratives, that you're some, somehow pushed down by the mammies, by the hand, the, the reach, the um, throttle, depends how you want to see the hand, pushing down, um, the claw, declaw, whatever you want to see. Something is pushing you down to your utmost subjection and telling you, without anything you might have done or been conscious of, on a conscious, so it's nothing that's been accomplished. It's, this is the anti-test too. You didn't achieve anything, you didn't understand a fucking word, and now you're set, told you passed. So that, that doesn't even, you're not sure what that means, but you were called on to have passed this test. That's your entire being. That's 
That's finitude. That's your timing and that's your being to have passed a test that you didn't understand, but you were tested the whole time. And you were waiting for another kind of call. I, think, I mean, it's, that's beautiful. I mean, it's like poetry because it, as I see this, this is like an Occam's razor. Uh, uh, this is death. I'm glad you like it. And, and because in, in this sense, what replaces us? You know, in our seat, that's my seat. But no, in the end, death replaces every one of us. Whatever. It, it might be a visitation of, of death and saying, you know, what something unintelligible, this is your finitude, now you have your position, this is your position. But what I did want to add to the passing of the test, there's no distinction, or it might be undecidable whether this is a failure or a passing. Even though the death or the reaper or the other guest ghost says, you passed, but passing where? Maybe you've passed on, maybe you've passed away, maybe you've passed the threshold. Um, and this guy, as, as Elaine points out, has been wanting to get up and shows minimal signs, but true signs, now I can accept a little bit of this, of resistance. So there's a resistance to this ghost coming to claim you and will pay for you to drink the hemlock, perhaps. And the coins on the eyes. Yeah, the yeah. So um, that's very, very helpful the way um, I, I would have to read my own resistance, but now I'm beginning to um, finally, I've been waiting for Andrew, I've been calling on you. I was going to bring up what you mentioned right at the very beginning, which was <coughs> undecidability, because it's hard to. Talk about undecidability without talking about Kurt Gödel and his undecidability theorem, where just a second, because we didn't talk about the projectile and the parabola and so on. I was thinking of that as well, but go ahead. Where basically, I mean, there are a couple of versions of it. One is where you're trying to look at a particle, and somebody asks you the question, "Where is this particle?" And you can't say it is at point A or point B. And also, on, in addition, you can't say, um, is this particle in decay or is this particle integral? So Gödel uh, deals with this paradox by just simply saying, these are questions that are undecidable. And uh, the only way to possibly answer an undecidable question is silence, which also brings up the matter of uh, Schrodinger's cat paradox, where you have, uh, you, you can't tell if the cat in the box is alive or dead until you open it up. So if somebody asks you what it is, you're always going to be wrong. So the only answer, again, is just silence. And I feel like the, uh, the meeting of the two servants is uh, a meeting of silence because the, whatever these questions are, they're undecidable. And therefore, the only correct answer is this emptiness. I'm, I'm interested in what you're saying. But I'm wondering, is it undecidable? Because he didn't even understand. He wasn't even up to the level of, of meeting the question. And note that there's also, and if we had the time to, um, um, to kind of race drive with Derrida's thought of this, what about this, maybe you're sorry that you invited me? I would love to jam on this, because is the invitation a contract? Like if you invite someone, and this has happened, right? And they're a dud, or in a shitty mood, mm -hmm. or a party pooper, or whatever, however you want to um, say. Well, in the undecidability theorem of girl, it's, it is that you don't understand. That's why it's undecided. You don't even understand what the question is because- Really? I thought with undecidable, you presented with um, very strong, but absolutely um, non-resolvable options. I'm saying it that's the way it seems in a kind of Cartesian, yeah. uh, Newtonian sense. But in quantum mechanics, it's, it's not I'm understandable. Not, okay, it's not understandable. It's not understandable because it defies. It's paradox, Par and paradox by its nature is not to be understood. Really. <laughs> You hope. Okay, I'm going to admit that.
provisionally because I'm, I'm interested, of course, in the limits between what can be understood and what, what is defies understanding because this is where we are and that's what writing and reading is always grappling with, uh, the greatest extreme being the end, my friend. Um. First off, your fourth theorem on incompatibility is a touchstone there, and it's a good, but we will leave that for a while. Right. Um, his position is also uh, a disposition, not only an attitude, but uh, a constellation of apparatus, something that, that affixes. So, so therefore, it's kind of, it's cognate, a job. But it's also a, a, a job which relates to the notion, uh, as you have in dispositif, uh, to posit, to posit is also to put forth, to lay on the table, to throw it out there in the Heideggerian sense, which means that it operates conditionally. So it operates as a condition. So in that philological economy between transmission, admission, remission, submission, to submit takes up a minor position and is also a submissive, uh, a, a minor letter, a, a reference to a letter, but taking up a place which is a minor place, as the Lewis and Valhari will talk about uh, how and literature, but it's also to take up that place which is conditional as a subjection, so that destabilizes the subject, does not let it, even in a place that is ostensibly its own, be at rest or, or will be complete, will be fixed or, or stable in any way. That's why I want to just, as I thank you for the extra um, round that you've offered, the extra inning, um, just say, so this test that gets passed and taken in ut utmost defeat does not match Prince with Bush's test, right? Yeah. Our nation is being tested, which comes from the more pumped up masculinist place of testing. So something happens here that can't be accounted for. And because it can't be accounted for in this account offered by um, Kafka, something passed. We're not sure what it is, and it could be life itself. So I, if, if I've scrambled everything, I'm so happy. Um, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. Okay, so just stay with it, live with it, dwell with it, and we'll, we'll see each other tomorrow and wash your hair, whatever you have to do for our class picture. <laughs> <laughs>